Now, unfortunately, there's still bad news from Libya, as local sources there have confirmed that at least 25 people have been killed and injured, 30 actually injured in a multiple bomb attack in the eastern town of al Quba. Three bombs went off, and the targets are believed to have been a patrol station, a police station, and the home of parliamentary speaker Aguila Salah. Now, Mr. Salah said the attack appeared to be in retaliation for recent Egyptian air strikes on Islamic State militants. Egypt struck after the group killed 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians, which it had abducted. Now, there is some contradiction in terms of how many lives were lost. Authorities placed the death toll at 30. But the, uh, that's out of a town population of 25,000. While locals are saying as many as 40 people were killed and 70 others sustained various degrees of injury. Speaking to an, a TV station in the Saudi-owned Al Arabiya, Mr. Salah announced seven days of mourning would be obs observed for the bomb victims. Al Quba lies on the road between Beida, which is the seat of the official Libyan government, and Derna, which is largely controlled by the Libyan affiliate of ISIS. Libya has been in chaos since 2011 and the overthrow of its then leader, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. Now, since then, numerous militia groups have battled for control, and the country has two rival governments and parliaments. Now, based on the escalation of violence in Libya, especially with the arrival of the Islamic State, the United Nations Security Council has held an emergency session on that situation. Italy has urged the international community to change pace in its reaction to the lawlessness gripping that country. There are fears that the group known as the Islamic State is securing a growing foothold in Libya after militants released a video showing beheadings of Egyptian Christians last weekend, which prompted retaliatory attacks in Cairo or by Cairo, which is why we saw the development today in Libya. Now, the Voice of America's Henry Ridgewell sent this report from London. Libyans in Tripoli celebrating the anniversary of the revolution, but four years after the NATO-backed overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi, lawlessness is breeding chaos. The beheading of 21 Egyptian Christians by the Islamic State, also known as ISIL or ISIS, has prompted fears that Libya is now fertile ground for the group to expand, says Mattia Toaldo of the European Council on Foreign Relations. There is a pool of Libyan jihadis who have fought in Afghanistan, fought in Syria and now are back to Libya. Uh, there are other terrorist organizations which have uh, uh, an open alliance with some of the factions, and I'm speaking of Ansar al-Sharia, and fighters from Ansar al-Sharia may be already defecting to ISIS and swelling its numbers. Across the Mediterranean, Italy is debating military action. Speaking Wednesday, Foreign Minister Paolo Gentiloni urged a collective global effort. Il deterioramento della situazione sul terreno the deterioration of the situation on the ground forces, and I emphasize, forces a change in pace by the international community before it's too late. The Islamic State has boasted of its ambition to conquer Rome. Italy feels itself on the front line, says Toaldo. The idea of having such a heinous and dangerous terrorist organization on your front yard, because that's what Libya is, it's just 300 miles from Sicily. Then I think there is the migration issue, this idea that uh, jihadis would be mixed with migrants on boats crossing the Mediterranean. There are fears that Islamic State is eyeing Libya's oil wealth to finance its terror network, says Libya specialist John Hamilton of cross-border information. I don't think it's actually possible for them to do that, but the, the fear that they could is, 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 is a nightmare um, which, which Islamic State I think, are very willing to encourage. Egypt carried out airstrikes on Islamic State positions in Libya following the beheadings. President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi has called for a United Nations resolution allowing international forces to intervene. That could compromise the UN's position, says Hamilton. While uh, Egypt has called for a UN uh, intervention of this kind, the UN is in fact uh, hosting uh, attempted peace negotiations between Islamist groups, not Islamic State. Uh, admittedly, but, but Islamist groups and the, 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 the recognized government of Libya. Um, they can't really do both of those things at the same time.
Military analysts question how far airstrikes alone would counter Islamic State in Libya. Yet yeah, bringing troops in will be fraught with difficulty. I mean, the one thing which would unite all the fractured uh, groups that are fighting in Libya uh, quicker than anything else would be a foreign intervention. Such is the conundrum for the West, balancing the risks of intervention against the danger of a failed state on Europe's southern shores. And now we're looking at health issues. There's still no cure for HIV and AIDS, and if things don't change a lot sooner than later, specifically on the African continent, the situation could escalate again if more is not done to prevent infection among teenagers. Experts are saying that parents and teachers need to engage in sex education with their teenagers, while leaders need to make it easier for under-18s to access HIV testing and treatment. According to figures released by organizations like the World Health Organization, there are 2.1 million adolescents worldwide living with HIV, and 80% of them are believed to be on the African continent. The majority do not know they have HIV and probably became infected at birth or through breastfeeding. This is Jane. She lives in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Jane is 16 years old and is HIV positive. Because of the stigma associated with the disease, she did not wish to be identified and we have changed her name to identity. I started falling sick often. I would also throw up. So I decided to go to a hospital to get checked. That's when I found out I was pregnant. When a woman is expectant, they do tests to check for diseases. That's when they did the HIV test, and that's how I discovered I was HIV positive. HIV and AIDS is the main cause of death amongst 10 to 19 year olds in Africa, and this is the only age group globally where AIDS related deaths are rising. Life can be brutal in Nairobi slums with alcoholic parents who fail to provide or who push their daughters into sex trade to feed the rest of the family. Girls as young as 10 often have sex to survive, only to end up becoming mothers themselves, infected with the same disease that robbed them of their parents. The infection rate amongst Kenyan females aged 15 to 24 is four times that of males. Girls start having sex younger than boys, usually with older men, and biologically, they get infected more easily. Jane was orphaned at the age of six. I had a lot of boyfriends because I was just looking for a way to survive, so I had no choice. But when you have a boyfriend, you have to give them something in order to get some money to provide for myself and my small sisters too. I'm also looking after them. Local NGOs and community organizations are trying to help. And Kenyan charity Liverpool Voluntary Counseling and Testing Center, LVCT, provides HIV and AIDS and sexual health services and education to teenagers. We discuss about secondary abstinence. We talk about issues of STIs, prevention, uh, the issues of drugs and alcohol. We talk about uh, how to prevent early or teenage pregnancy. And in case one of them have ever had that or have has a baby, how are they able to live safely and prevent infection of HIV? Kenya's HIV prevalence rate is falling from 13.5% in 1999 to 5.6% today. It has the fourth largest HIV positive population in the world, 1.7 million, most of whom are middle-aged. The East African nation has made great strides in rolling out HIV testing amongst adults but needs to do more to address the cultural and structural drivers of HIV and AIDS amongst teenagers, such as dropping out of school. We must do everything to ensure that we keep all our children in school, at least up until the age of 18. Free primary, free secondary education must be meaningful. Although the fight against AIDS is making progress globally, current policies are failing to save the lives of teenagers. 
The UN believes it can end the global threat of HIV and AIDS by 2030 with a push to scale up testing and treatment by 2020.